Hey everybody, welcome back. Nevin UG, original Grognar, sitting down here taking a look at, oh my god, this isn't something, this hasn't even gotten to Kickstarter yet. Space Infantry Resurgence, lock and load games. I was fortunate enough to have been uh, given a prototype copy of Space Infantry Resurgence long before even the Kickstarter starts off. So I guess, I guess, I get to do some playtesting with it as well as doing an unboxing of it. I guess that's how we're looking at it. Um, for those of you in the know, and most of you probably should be, uh, Lock and Load released uh, Space Infantry five, six years ago. And the original edition was pretty good. I had a lot of fun with it. I, one of the first videos I ever did when I was doing my, when I started off my channel was actually for Space Infantry. And there's a lot of good stuff in this box. Again, Lock and Load just continues to, 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 to raise the bar on the components and just the sheer weight of stuff that they're, they're packing into these games. Um, not much has changed rules-wise. I mean, literally, if you, if you know how to play the original Space Infantry, you're going to know how to step right into Resurgent. There is some things that they have expanded on, but uh, for the most part, the core mechanics are all really the same. So, let's go ahead and uh, let's take a look inside Space Infantry Resurgence. Now again, prototype version, which means the components are going to be different than the retail and the Kickstarter. So, you know, if you see something in here that's not the same as, as, as what you get, again, prototype. And we start off with a box and a lid. Again, three inch deep. And as you can, I open it up, you can see it barely can contain everything that's in here. The thing I like about these 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 three inch boxes is that they really remind me of the old SPI uh, detergent box games that SPI did back. I think those were a slightly bigger, but uh, you know that when you got a box this big and as heavy as this thing is. It's going to have a lot of good stuff in it. And there's a lot of stuff in here. Lots of cards. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of cards. So, where to start? Gee, I don't even know where to start. Let's go, uh... Yeah, alright, so let's take a look. Let's take a look at some of these. These are, these are, these are enemy cards. And there's a lot more enemies and a lot more cards in this one than there were in the original. So, and not... A lot, and some of the enemies don't have a lot of cards, like say for the, these armored buildings. I mean, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, six armored building cards. And yes, if you'll notice, they're not exactly 100% cut. Again, prototype, get over it, deal with it. But, you know, it's, it, 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 it's still Space Infantry Resurgence. Your fire skills, your melee skills, how many hit points you've got, and any type of special uh, special abilities that they have. Now, armored building isn't going to be an enemy type, that <laughs> a prime enemy type. It's going to be something that's going to show up in special scenarios and special missions. Uh, just like here, we have Titan. Big, nasty Titan tank. Although, <laughs> have less hit points than the armored building. But again, you know, all the important pertinent information... That's on here that you'll roll randomly. And again, you're going to run into these. It's like there's three Titan tanks. So, you know, you got three different variations of a Titan tank you might run into in a special mission or something. And grav tanks and turrets. Actually, there's only one turret counter. No, that's cool. Um, but then you start getting into the regular enemies. Their troop cards. Here's, here's Dark Faith. Not a lot of Dark Faith cards either. But, you know... Dark Faith Acolyte, 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 Daemon. Oh, great. Yeah, Demons. Wonderful. Acolyte, Acolyte, Daemon. Yeah, so Acolytes and Daemons. Um, again, it's still, you know, it's got their armored, how many hit points they have, what their fire skill is, what their melee skill is, and if they got two numbers, then they basically are attacking twice. Uh, mercenaries are kind of one of the full-on factions, uh, although, there's, again, there's not really that many mercenary types. You've got soldiers, assault, sergeant, so, again, it's all, you know, <laughs> basic enemy guards. Uh, 
Let's go. Let's look at something else. It's a, some more enemy types that are a little bit more filled out. Yeah, here we go. Nasty, nasty, buggy aliens. Flesh Eaters. Yeah, your basic warrior type. You got a bunch of Flesh Eaters. And then Flesh Eater Xenotypes. I don't know what the difference is between a Flesh Eater and a Flesh Eater Xenotype. I mean, Xenotype is just alien type. So, you know, Flesh Eaters are alien. So, Flesh Eater Alien Alien Type? I don't know. <laughs> but they're definitely one of the uh, one of the enemy types that you're going to run into. Lots of Flesh Eater Xenos. Void Spiders. Kind of think... Uh, uh, what would be a good... Uh, the, now, what are they called in Dead Space? The Necrophiles. That's, that's a good idea. I think that's what the what the Void Spiders are. But lots and lots of Void Spiders. Dark Roots. No, no. Dark Roots are the uh, are the uh, Necrolites. Yeah, Dark Roots are the Necrolites. Let's take a look. Yeah, Cthon. Ah. Cthulhu. <laughs> that's Cthonian Young. That's, these are that Cthonian Old One. And these guys are beefy. Two armor piercing. One, two, three, four, five, six hit points. Ugh. And then... You know, some dark root creepers, giants. So, yeah, bunch of, bunch of, bunch of, bunch of, bunch of enemies. And these are all the enemy types that you could possibly draw whenever you get into an engagement in a node in the game. Let's see, what else have we got? Oh, some other battle drones. Let's see, what else have we got? Beastmasters. They're kind of cool. Mutants. They can have weird mutant powers that show up in game. What else have we got? Cybers. Really, you want to guess what they are? Flavornetic <laughs> Sentinels. So, battle drones. Oh. Yeah, these guys. That's, that's kind of a beefy guy. Four hit points. Mutants. Outlier. Eh, you know, type. And then, of course, you know, you got the types in the upper right-hand corner. Type 1, type 2, type 3. So, you know, when you roll randomly, it's like, oh, two type 2s and one type 3. And then you draw randomly. And that's those are the bad guys that you're going to face in that combat. So those are just the troop card or the uh, enemy cards. Let's see what else do we want to go. Uh, let's go over and take a look at uh, personnel cards, personality cards. Now these are these are you. This is unit selection. This is this is the cards that that you will use to form up uh, your 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 squad. And so you know you got an AP or a tank. I have no idea what that definition is, but it's a tank. And you don't get this on every mission. You can't buy this. This is only only given on certain missions. Steel bones, pillum ATV. And then, you know, technicians, and it basically breaks down skill points, fire fire combat value, movement combat modifier, fire value, melee value, uh, wounds, and then their different skills. They got a repair three, security three, computer four. And that's basically how many dice you're going to throw. <laughs> no, it's not. It's what the target number you're looking for is. When, so let's throw a single dice to try to get successes. I'll get into that a little bit. Um, so yeah, you got Explorer, Medic, Zero G, Team B, Assault Team. I don't know why they call them Assault Team B, Zero Team B. I, as far as I know, these aren't actual squads. They're just the, the team members. So, you know, I guess it's easier to solve, call it Assault Team B than try to come up with Assault Trooper Williamson or something like that. Um, and there is the occasional, yeah, there's an armor, armor, armored, so he gets an armor save. Flamers, heavy weapons, CNC, command and control, demolitions, scientists, and then eventually you get to, uh, uh, veteran versions of the, of the same members. So there's a fire, normal, regular fire team A, and then here's the, Here's the uh, the veteran version, which means, you know, they, they have better stuff and they, of course, cost more points. Assault teams. As far as I know, it's just the actual team members themselves, not the specialists. I don't think the specialists like like the explorer or the medic or the technician have a veteran version. So that's those guys. What else have we got? Let's take a look at uh, strategic options. <laughs> These are just different things that can show up in game. 
depending on the scenario you're playing eventually you, you know you get to get sometimes get to a get to a point where you get to draw a strategic option card i think i don't remember <laughs> anything beyond that uh now some of these oops put that on too tight uh strategy cards not real. these are the hive strategy card yeah these are the xeno mind yeah, the Xeno mine. So I think these are used. Um, you it used to be the game was completely solitaire. I don't think there was a co-op or a PvP version. Um, this is this does have rules in it for a PvP version. I think these. Yeah, these are the strategy cards for the Xeno mine, and you can do a hive scenario uh, as a player versus player. So you can have two people, and this is what the this is what the the alien would use as his deck as his deck to show what uh his different uh you know the different things that he can do and he can, how he can modify you know his own troops and make it things more difficult on the uh the human space marines so that's that deck yeah, it's kind of funny because the original game was just completely solitaire. Like I said, it had no uh, player versus player, no co-op or anything. This game is solitaire, and you can do it co-op, and you can do it player versus player, and there's uh, horde mode. It kind of almost reminds me of uh, uh, kind of like a, a, a first-person shooter or something like that. It's like, yes, go online, friends, co-op, player versus player, horde mode. Okay, that just kind of struck me funny. Uh, <laughs> encounter cards, uh, encounters that can that can show up, and I think you can draw one of these uh, permission or one of these can get added in permission. I think these are part of the campaign. I don't think these are part of the regular scenarios. I have to go through the rules again, but again, a bunch of big tarot sized cards for that. For encounters. And those are above and beyond what you'll normally find in a mission. Uh, and then, speaking of missions, actual mission cards themselves. Let's see if I can get these. Yeah. So, you're doing mission one, then this is the mission card you pull. Objective, explore all three mission nodes. Alert level. If you want to, there are there are. You can actually play the game. It has multiple settings, so you can increase the difficulty uh, depending on what the alert level is. Alert level two, alert level three, and so if you're going to play mission one on normal mode, then it's just normal. But if you want to increase the difficulty a little bit, um, mission alert level two and the event string, and we'll kind of show that when we get to the node cards would increase, and then if you even want to do. Alert level three. We draw another mission card, and uh, these are these are all the different four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So there's twelve regular missions, and then the hive missions. Two, three, four, seven, eight. Yeah, lots of hive missions, and then cards on how to how to run the hive, and then uh, let's see what are those. I think those are Oh yeah, those are those are setting up the actual hordes. So you not only can you do a horde mission, you can have a horde mission with different opponents, you randomly draw basically what horde mode is is you're standing there and trying to hold off hordes and hordes and it's zombie mode basically. <laughs> so and then this is, you know, this is how this is the card to set up you know, after you draw which horde mission you're doing, then you draw what opponent you're doing. Choose or draw randomly. Uh, this gives the setup for, all right, you're facing hordes of flesh eaters, use this card. Hordes of cybers, hordes of mutants, hordes of mercs, hordes of dark faith, dark roots, flesh eaters, yada, yada, yada. So there's a lot of replayability because there's 12 basic missions and, what, eight different horde missions, and each one of those missions can have one of... Eight different enemy types. Yeah, it, there is never going to be a mission that you are going to play that's going to be the same mission twice. It's just not going to happen. Not only from the types of missions and the types of enemies, but I also varied up how the missions run. We'll be getting into that in a little bit. Um, and then you've got <clears throat> the actual cards themselves that go on... Um, the nodes. If you remember in, in the last game, when you would play out a mission card or scenario card, 
the nodes were set. That but nodes are basically the the areas you have to travel through and defeat to get to your objectives. And they were all set. So if you did this mission, it's like, all right, the first one is a security. Go down this path. It's going to be a computer over this way. It's going to be a combat encounter, yada, yada, yada. So you knew what each mission was going to be. And it kind of killed the replayability a little bit because, well, you knew what was coming up. Here, now, you've got cards. And all the nodes are now drawn randomly. So we've got a bunch of indoor. we got outdoor. we got space. we got underground. we got passageways. And these cards replace the nodes on the maps as you're going through and playing the game. And they have the exact same information on them as, as, they, as it used to with a little bit more information than it used to be. So it's like, so here's, you know, graphical design of it. Here's the string right here, 3 plus B. So if this is the encounter string, when you actually get into the room, you roll a dice. If it's a 3 plus, you're going to be facing a B encounter. Fairly simple. Also, this number up here, the, kind of in the red tab, is the alert level. So remember I was mentioning you can make the games harder, alert level one, two, three. So if you're playing an alert level one mission, you're going to take out, say you're setting up indoors, because that's an indoor, you'll take out all the two to three difficult alert levels, because basically you're not playing at that difficulty. So for example, here's, here's one, it's an alert level one. So if you're playing alert level one, that's, you'll have this card as possible one of the cards you draw. And then the skill to get into this node, you need a computer with two successes. We'll be getting into that in a little bit. But yeah, it's basically that's, and there's a whole bunch of cards, you know, advance, climb, tracking, zero G, bunch of different skills, bunch of different encounters you could possibly run into. And with all the alert levels, one through three. So that's how you pop you. Those are the cards you populate your board with, and we'll and uh, we're getting to that. Don't get so excited. We're getting to the boards. But uh, what else have we got? You also have scenario specific, uh, like like again, these are campaign for if you're doing a campaign, and the campaign rules are very extensive. You also have other special extra nodes that you throw in if you're doing a campaign, but. You know, if you're doing Mission 1, then you also grab the Mission 1 cards, and they go on specific spots on the on the mission table as well, or on your board as well. And again, they, they, they run the exact same as every other card. Your encounter string, the alert level, and the difficult, uh, the, 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 the skill, and the number of successes needed to get into that node. Pretty simple. And every mission has, like there's mission two, mission two, mission four, <clears throat> mission seven. So each mission has, not only do you have its norm, you, the normal deck of encounter cards, but you also have mission-specific cards that you're going to run into. I think that's kind of cool. So that right there <clears throat> is going to make sure that no two games are ever alike. Just <laughs> that easy. Uh, now, War Theater mission cards. These are for uh, the camp for when, when you're doing a, 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 the camp one of the campaign games. Not every campaign game. And then you've got some uh, question mark cards, which are used primarily in the hive. We'll be getting into that in a little bit, but they're all special nodes, special nodes. Special nose. So basically, when you come across one of those, you go to a separate table to find out, all right, what's exactly in here. Uh, and then not only have you got regular missions, you've also got the hive missions. Yes, I'm getting to the hive in a little bit. And the hive have got their own deck that they use to populate as well. Again, all the cards are exactly the same. Encounter string, alert level, skill to enter the node, number of successes needed. Pretty damn easy. All right, so hive. What's cool about the hive? The hive, you never know what the hive is going to look like because you've got these 12 cards and you kind of draw them randomly and just kind of lay them out. So, you know, it's possible. You know, you can have some really weird layouts as you travel from zone to zone. And basically, this is where you put these encounter, these node cards. Where were they? Where's the hive? Right, right here. So when you populate the, the, the deck or populate the board, you'll take these hive cards and then you'll place them on the board as you're moving through. 
So hive missions are completely random. You have no idea. I mean, you don't know from one board to the next. So you might find the board you're looking for in one board, or it might take you half a dozen different boards before you find out exactly the one board that's got the one node that you need on it. So yeah, it's kind of roguelike, if you know from the the the, the, the computer term roguelike games. Yeah. Uh, and then you got some player aid cards, orders. These are all the different uh, different orders that you can uh, give your squad to do above and beyond just the normal stuff. Sequence of play, got to have a sequence of play. It's your standard mission, combat mission, campaign play. Oh, the last outpost. That's the other that's the other mode type. I don't want to say it's a it's a it's a tower defense, but it's kind of like a tower defense. Um so last outpost play and then the horde play. Your turn record track. Most turn most most scenarios you got 30 turns period to be able to uh to go through and try to finish the mission and any squad resources you may have right there all right so this is what i'm sure some of the people and what some of you out there have been looking forward to these are the bad guy cards these are the master cards for whatever enemy you're going to be facing in a scenario and it gives you you know Basic flavor text. Beastmaster is a cult from the outer fringes of the system. These genetic extremists practice mutation and modification to an almost insane degree, calling themselves Beastmasters. They've launched a series of terror attacks against the inner system with the goal of evolving humanity to their vision of our future. The fact that their war beasts are forcibly evolved deserters from their same cult means they've already gone too far. So, yeah, bad guys. Um, and then when, uh, when you're going into combat, you know, what range these guys are going to be set at, the initial... And then uh, if, you know, if, if they're at, a, at melee range, it's possible they could change. Or if they're at fire range, it could change. But anyway, it's a little random table to randomly determine what range they start up at. And then when you, deter when you, when you, when you find out who you're fighting against, when you, when, you, when you have an encounter, like say right here, this is a 5A encounter. So if you roll a 5 or better, you'll face an A-level encounter. Well, you look at your Beastmaster sheet. It's an A-level encounter. So you roll randomly or draw a random number. There's a couple different ways you can do it and that'll tell you exactly what you show up with so you get a zero you're only gonna be facing one war beast you get a four it's gonna be three war beasts now as you can tell class b is a little bit more beefy at a zero it's one war beast but a class b encounters two war beasts and a class c yeah it yeah the difficulty really ramps up but so you got beast masters and cybers and flesh eaters and titans and armored uh, bunkers. I don't know why they call it just. I don't know why they just. It's just a bunker. <laughs> Flesh eater, dark faith, Cathothians, Cthulhu, uh, cyber sentinels, grav tanks. So yeah, basically all your. And then there are a couple boss mobs. <laughs> So yeah, enemy flesh eater xenotype. You're probably only going to encounter this in one or two missions, and it's yeah, that's 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 the boss. So he's got several different <laughs> locations you can attack. Yeah, and then an elder leviathan from the Cathothians, I think. So yeah, not only do they have normal bad guys, they also got boss fights. And like I said, it it did. Really, really reminds me of a video game. I know I'm a bad person. Uh, all right, so these here are your scenario cards. These are the, or these are actually the the, the, the play boards. Uh, each scenario, and you can kind of notice this one is right here is number sixteen, and this is actually one of the horde missions. Um, well, let's go over and just take a look. At, okay, this is a normal one. This is this is this is mission one. Crimson Striker. So this is probably the board that you're going to be using when you first play the game. Uh, or when you play the game for the first time, because this is mission one. One of our deep range scientist stations has gone dark. Three cycles we sent a query. Four cycles we sent you. Gear up and uh, report back why the nerds have stopped talking. <laughs> so, and then the objective right here. Explore all three mission nodes. Special rules, and then any special rules for it, and then any special symbols that are on it. But you'll always have a start location. And again, if you'll notice, you've got an outdoor, indoor, indoor, mission one, indoor, indoor, mission one, mission one. These are how you passage. This is how you populate the deck with the node cards. So you're doing this mission, you'll grab an outdoor card for here. And since there's only one of them, you only draw one of them. And again, it's going to be an outdoor card that's going to be whatever alert level. And so you draw randomly, put it down, and then you populate the rest of the deck. Indoor, indoor, and you just draw randomly from the node decks. So, 
And then you remember when I was mentioning the mission specific cards? These are where the mission specific it tells you where. So it's it's really easy once you understand what what it's trying to tell you and once you understand what it all means. You know, you can get a game set up in less than five minutes, even by populating everything. And there are certain things you've got. Uh, uh, these are resource. Uh, you can get resources from here. I think that's an intelligence resource, and that's grenades and munitions. But, you know, when you're in that node and you complete that node, there's a chance you can get extra supplies. So, And there's there's a card for every mission, and there's like, what, 16, 18 missions? So, and like, here's for, here's mission two, Cryptic Axe. And so you start off up here, and again, it's just, all right, mission-specific cards, underground cards, underground cards, and then, you know, objective, find at least four of the scientists, special rules, off-road. Yeah, this one. Your squad is equipped with a Pillum APC for their mission. May only use, be used on outdoor nodes, which there really is just three of. <laughs> Actually, no. Okay, all these mission-specific guards are outdoor nodes. So basically, you can use your Pillum to drive around to the different caves. I guess these are underground caves that you got to be searching. But there's just a huge amount of these mission boards. I see that one's that one's kind of busy. Spectral form. And they're double sided. So there's something on the back side of as well. So you've got a, a wide variety of mission types that you're going to be undertaking. Um, and again, like I showed you that last one was a horde map. This is one of the smaller horde maps. I haven't read too much into the horde rules. I'm probably not going to do much. I might eventually do a gameplay on horde mode, but I'm going to try to figure out the rest of the game first. It's not double-sided. And here is the outpost mission, which I kind of told you is kind of like a tower defense mission. That's the best way I have of, of putting it. But then, you know, this is how you this is how you, you, you run that mission. That's mission 17. Um, and then for, I think this is, I think this is the co-op. Yeah, this is the co-op player card. So if you're playing cooperatively with a buddy, this is the card that you use for your two squads and your co-op playing. Nothing on the back of that. Um, and then we have some horde missions. Let's see. I haven't looked through all these. Yeah, so H6, End of the Dark, that's a Horde mission. So, Horde mission 5. I have to have to put these in order. So all the Horde mission, these are the mission cards. And I'm not sure what the, SB, what the SBs are. I think, uh, I'm not sure what that's for. I think that's for a campaign. Oops, helps if I actually... Uh, mission SBO2 with Land War, or Mission SBO1 basis. I think those are part of a, of a bigger campaign and uh, replace the regular mission cards. Yeah, Hit and Fade, Dark Below, Core. So yeah, a bunch of Horde missions, all that, all that good stuff. More mission cards. More cards. Um, cool thing, uh, it does give you some pre-generated squad cards that you can use. Like this is J Squad, uh, 51st Company, and it's already got the team set out. It's got Fire Team A, Fire Team B, Assault A, Assault B, CQC, Support Units, Shotgun, Sniper, Heavy Woman, yada, yada, yada. 51st Company, a little flavor text, Company Traits, Space Infantry Traits. I'm pretty sure these are used for campaigns. I think the, the couple of the campaigns, it's like, all right, use Mako Squad 65th Company. And that's what you start off with. But they also give blank sheets. Uh, for you to photocopy off so you can make up your own squads, which what you're that's what you're going to be doing most of the time anyways. There's the squads. And these are these are yeah, these are these are some of the campaign cards. Uh, which will tell you, you know, your campaign you, which campaign number you're doing, which mission deck you're pulling from. You know, strategic operations, those are your resources, mission decks. It's just in mission procedure and, of course, victory points because it's kind of a role-playing system because you want your uh, you want to get victory points to make your people better. But, yeah, Steel Bones, these are all just different campaigns, Second Contact War, uh, Exodus Raids, yada, 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 yada. And those are all single-sided. And then we have the Robot. <laughs> spiral bound. Now, from what I understand, uh, the spiral bound is something you have to pay extra for. Um, 
Not to talk out of turn, but I think they're charging like 30 bucks to have the rule books uh, spiral bound. And I think you can get it done at uh, a print shop for much cheaper. But you run the risk of the print shop people not knowing what they're doing. And I've had heard horror stories where they've, they've, they've mucked it up uh, and cut more <laughs> than they were supposed to have. But again, it's your typical new lock and load style, really big fonts. Lots of graphics showing off, you know, complete components. And counter inventory. Well, not a counter inventory, but an example of counters. And then it goes straight into the rules. What the different nodes mean, what all the different cards mean, how to perform a skill check. And then in the actual rules itself. And the rules itself aren't that much. I mean, the standard... I think the standard rules, 21 to 40, so 19 pages of rules with a frequently asked question. So it's not, I mean, again, this book is, this book is, looks rather daunting and intimidating, but, you know, for the actual base game itself, not that many rules to it. And again, these rules are written well enough that it's even a dullard like myself can pick them up. Uh, so, you know, don't be intimidated by this rule book. And they have a nice standard standard play example, which goes on for about eight or ten pages. Goes through the node, goes through event checks, combat rounds. So if you're having any issues with the gameplay, it's got a, it's got a, it's got a well laid out example of play. Then it goes into the missions for hive missions, and I think that's like another four or five, six pages, eh, eight pages on how to do hives, and then mission variables, fear. Uh, shaken, mutations, boss rules for whenever you run into a boss. Uh, then you get into campaign play. And the campaign play, the campaign probably has got more uh, more rules in it than the main, uh, <laughs> than the main rules. It's uh, 61 to 70 something. That's the example of play. 74. So yeah, the campaign the rules themselves are just almost as beefy as the main as the main rules themselves and then of course there it is right there a campaign play of examples so if you have any issues with figuring out how the campaign play is it goes through step by step and telling you how exactly a campaign play goes through there are several pages and then there's optional rules because you got to have optional rules Uh, and then special, yeah, special campaigns. That's, that's, that's the S series I was showing you off, but they're, uh, they're set up a specific way. Uh, I haven't read over this, so I don't know what exactly is different, but there's, you know, war theater maps and armored buildings and they just do a whole bunch of different things. It's, it's more variety on a theme. Um, these, uh, from what I understand, these are more uh, specific because so if you do this type of mission, you're always going to be facing this type of enemy. So. Uh, special campaign, if you're going against flesh eaters and Z flesh eater xenotypes. Multiplayer, the xeno hive mind, how, how the hive mind works. Multiplayer, squad corporal. And so there's a lot of different modes in this game that you can play. PvE, PvP, co-op, or game variant. The last outpost, like I said, I, that kind of reminds me of a tower defense and then rules in horde play. How do you do a horde mission? So there's something in here for everybody <laughs> and even more than that, really. Again, more horde rules, horde, and then you get into the glossary, which is always good because they it does use some, I don't want to say non- standard non-traditional but it's sometimes a good to have a glossary for what exactly it's like event string it's not really a term you hear in role-playing game it's something you hear in computer programming in event string but you know okay let's take a look what is an event string yeah right here event string right there also referred to as strings found at the bottom of a node uh the string is made up of two parts the scope a range of the random number must fall into order to trigger the event and the class casual or serious events so you know there it is you've got your definitions right there because a lot of them a lot of times you may not know what some of these definitions are because they're not definitions words that you see a lot of times in traditional war gaming uh and then you have you know uh these are these are just uh duplicates of these cards that I showed earlier that are, that are in the book you know, squad formations, yada, yada, yada. 
And there you go. That's the rules right there. Like that. Now, the last important part is the part that I know everybody always wants to see. They want to see the rule book and they want to see the counters. I'll take a look at the counters. All right, again, prototype counters. These are laser etched. Final counters will be die cut. These counters are thick as beasts. Look at thumb for scale. The retail and Kickstarter counters are only two millimeters, I think. So it's going to be slightly smaller than this. Why the prototype is bigger than the uh, than the actual uh, retail and Kickstarter versions, I have no idea. It just that's what Block and Load decided to do. So yeah, cool, whatever, you know. <laughs> Not like I had any input in it. Um, but yeah, so, and again, it's your typical lock and load. You know, you punch right out. You know, void gate. I am going to have to trim these down just because my OCD bunt they're <laughs> clipped already. Oh my God, I love clip corner, clip, clip counters. Uh, so what do we got? Yeah, we got uh, we got uh, void gates. Not really sure what those are for. Uh, different squad members, and then I know these enemy types. That's for horde mode, and these yellow counters covers obstacles. That's for horde mode as well, um, and then just administrative markers. They're pretty much the same on both sides. And then a whole bunch of administrative markers, negative action points active camo, just different skills that you might have, events to mark where you remember uh, an event having taken place so you don't have to. So when you go through a node, complete the event, you know, five plus a that event. If you complete that event, put an event marker down, you don't have to run into that event the next time you move through there. Uh, and just, you know, various administrative markers, again, slightly different on the back, not by much. And then the final sheet. They did, the original game had you drawing a bunch of chits for your random dice roll numbers. They some people liked that, some people didn't, because the way it ran in the last game, um, you would have to draw so many chits before you could refill the chit cup or put all the chits back. And if you know there's only three of each one of them and you're starting to draw the chit, you kind of start to figure out what the numbers <laughs> left coming up are possibly going to be. Uh, but then there's also the possibility you can get a critical hit, critical failure, which is what the zero and the plus is to indicate critical hit, critical failure. I, does, I have not come across in the rules where it says how often, if you're using the chit pull system, how often you refill the cup. I just don't know. I, I don't know if it'd be by encounter, by each time, because it, it would throw off how often the zero and plus would show up. If you're refilling the, the, the chits after every, say, 10 pulls, then that's going to skew how often a critical hit or critical failure is going to going to show show up as compared to if you're doing it after every encounter or if you're refilling the chit for every draw. Um, so I don't really know how often. I don't remember. I, I skimmed over the rules, but I don't remember seeing anything specifically on how to use the random chits. Uh, so hopefully... No. May point that out to, to, to lock and load and let them know. Hmm, may want to may may want to clear that up a little bit. Uh, resources you can carry a bunch of resources: grenades, med kits, intelligence, smoke grenades, plasma grenades, a whole bunch of stuff like that. And you know the counters here, wound markers, action points, successes, just a whole bunch of administrative markers. So there you go. That's it in a nutshell. Um, I don't have any idea what the stretch goals are. Um, it's possible that I may have had a couple of them. You know, hey, maybe maybe the horde mode is a, is a, is a stretch goal. Um, since the Kickstarter hasn't been released, I haven't been informed what any of the stretch goals are yet. In fact, there might not be any stretch goals in here. You know, knowing how Lock and Load loves to, to pile up a bunch of stretch goals, um, you know, there you get the Kickstarter and there's going to be a bunch of stretch goals. Cause I, you know, like most Lock and Load games, well, if, if World of War is any indication, um, yeah, it's going to hit its target number and it's going to bury itself in, uh, in stretch goals. So keep an eye out for this one, boys and girls. You're going to want to get into the ground floor with the Kickstarter as soon as it comes out, just so you can get all the goodness. And like I said, it's a great solitaire game. 
I've played it in the past. I enjoyed it. Um, it's it's a co-op game. It's player versus player. It's horde. It's tower defense. And who knows what else they can come up with when they do the Kickstarter. So uh, we are going to be getting this to the table. Um, just give me a couple more days to go over some stuff. But yes, we we I, I'm I'm kind of uh, tossing up and up and up in the air if I should do World at War or if I should do Space Infantry. I think I'm going to go with Space Infantry first. Um, but we are going to be getting both both games to the table. So we can get some gameplay out of this. I think that's all I got. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms in the comment section. I'll see you next time. Shake up.